Croesia Knitlad Kenneletho Cymru, Aki Peerhead Heno, and Diolchenvaur Erdod. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the Peerhead tonight for the Royal Television Society annual lecture. We are pleased this year uh, that the lecture will be given by Gito Harry, who is the Director of Communications for News UK. Now, Gito is, of course, instantly recognisable to us all from his days as Chief Political Correspondent at the BBC. So we all know his secrets, which is very helpful when it comes to questions. So who better than to give us an insight into how the UK media views Wales, and in particular, the reporting of Welsh political and civic life? But before we hear Gito, I would like to just cast your minds back to the RTS lecture last year. Now, I stood on this very platform and outlined my concerns about what I call the democratic deficit. And I believe it is one of the most profound problems facing devolution in Wales. We have to ask who is relaying, or perhaps more importantly, who will be relaying the work of the National Assembly to the people of Wales in the future. And of course, performing that crucial role of holding the decision makers here in Cardiff to account. We have a UK media, both broadcasters and print, which fails to report the huge differences in approach to public policy in devolved fields such as health and education. It means there's a substantial Welsh audience often gets information that doesn't apply to them at all. Now, research by Professor Anthony King and Cardiff University School of Journalism highlighted the fact that some of our leading UK broadcasters often default to an Anglo-centric position, a position which promotes policy issues affecting only England as though they apply to the whole of the UK. Now, Professor King's original report was published in 2008, and at the RTS lecture last year, he noted that despite efforts by some broadcasters, the problem still exists. The situation is compounded by the financial pressures on our indigenous Welsh national and regional press, which leaves many unable to resource comprehensive coverage of assembly news. Last year, I committed to holding a series of sessions in this building in an attempt to start a discussion about the issue and to possibly find solutions. In May, we had a fascinating discussion with a panel of leading UK journalists, including Kevin Maguire, Peter Riddle, and Peter Knowles. And that was um, chaired by the former head of global news at the BBC, Richard Sambrook. Now, I don't accept the headline assertion of the UK media that all our debates here are boring, any more than that all those in Westminster are actually interesting. Our debate on organ donations was wise, profound, and important, as anything you'll hear in, par in any parliament this year. And I believe, and of course, it will have a major impact on people's lives in Wales and across the UK. Now, the Assembly will, of course, continue to challenge UK media outlets to properly report the work we do at the, at the Senate to their Welsh audiences, and indeed those beyond Wales. But it was the other sessions we held with Wales' local regional press and digital media platforms that perhaps offered more hope and scope for action. Over the summer months, we've been taking some of those interesting ideas and formulating a response, including what I think are some innovative proposals. Much of it focuses on what support can be provided to the emerging digital platforms in the covering of the Welsh Assembly. So we plan to work with digital and hyper-local media and partner organisations to create a journalism hub in the Senedd that could provide content to these new digital channels. Uh, we'll be making it easier to report by providing better communication facilities on the Senedd estate, making the Assembly's data more open and accessible, ensuring that Assembly members are fully informed about how best to use the communication tools which are now available in this digital age, I think that's particularly referring to me, by the way, so I'm not really there yet. Uh, we intend to work more closely with media organisations to take the Assembly out to the communities they represent with a series of regional press days, and also working with those organisations to provide induction sessions for trainee journalists to ensure a better understanding of the work of our institution. Now, for us to move forward on these proposals, the Assembly will need the support of media organisations, both old and new, as well as journalists and other partners. So over the coming weeks, we plan to discuss in fuller detail with these partners and develop some of these ideas. 
and one of the main comments from our peerhead sessions was that all of us are talking about the issue, but nothing seems to be done to address it. So the National Assembly must and will play its part. So I look forward to working closely with many of you here tonight to turn our discussions about the democratic deficit into action. So thank you very much. And before we hear Gito, it's my great pleasure to introduce Tim Char Hartley, who is chair of the Wales Arts RTS Centre. Tim. I'll be speaking a little bit in Welsh to start with, if you want to put the headphones on just for a moment. Well, I'm going to be here to talk about this, and I'm going to be here to talk about this, and I'm going to be here to talk about this, and I'm going to be here to talk about this. I'm going to be here to talk about this, and I'm going to be here to talk about this, and I'm going to be here to talk Ac erbyn hyn, mae rhyw bartneriaeth gyda ni gyda digwyddiadau sy'n digwydd fel o'r llywydd yn sôn amdani nhw. Ac uh, mae hwn yn ildyniant heno i'r areth geson ni uh, gyda'r athro Tony King y llynedd yn ymdarlith flynyddol. Oherwydd mae'r drafodaeth yn ymestyn ar hyd uh, yr ystod o ddewisiadau sina ar gyfer y cyfryngau yng Nghymru, a beth mae hyn yn ei olygu i ddemocratiaeth go iawn. Mae rhai yn sôn mae'r peth pwysicau i wyddio gelu a uh, uh, cael llu debyd ar gyfer rhaglenni newyddion a materion cyfoes. Mae'r eich yn gweud nad yw hynna'n mynd yn ddigon pell, a bod ni adlewyrchu'n hynna'n Cymru i Gymru uh, ar draws pob genre o rhaglenni teledu a radio. Carfan arall wrth gwrs yn gweud, o'n ni'n bai yn bod ni'n darlledu, uh, datganoli darlledu a ni'n chyfanrwydd yna byddwn ni ddim yn cyflawn ni yr hyn rydyn ni'n ceisio i wneud. Mae'r drafodaeth heno yn amserol felly, a uh, herwydd yr hyn sy'n digwydd yn yr Alban a gyda'r bleidles ar annibyniaeth, a hefyd uh, cyhoeddiad uh, llywodraeth prydain o uh, ddatganoli um, gyrymodd dros drethiant i Gymru. Felly mae'r holl pethau mae'n cynniwar ac wi'n creu bod ein bwysig i ni ystyried yn ei chyfanrwydd felly beth yw ymateb y cyfryngau torfol y papurau uh, ar teledu. Um, to our guest speaker now, uh, Gitto Harry is a Cardiff boy, I'm glad to say. He was educated at Ysgol Gyfyn Llan Harry, uh, studied politics, philosophy and economics in Oxford, before coming back to Cardiff and doing the postgraduate uh, journalism course at the university. He had a long career at the BBC. Uh, he did stints in Rome and North America before becoming the chief political correspondent. He had a short time then in public affairs before in 2008 uh, joining Boris Johnson as the Director of Communications during Boris's first term as Mayor of London. Last year, he became Director of Communications for uh, News UK, formerly News International, a Rupert Murdoch company, which uh, owns The Sun, uh, The Times, and The Sunday Times. Uh, and perhaps it is uh, timely that we're having this uh, lecture this week when it's the opening week in the, the case against Rebecca Brooks and, uh, and uh, Coulson, and of course um, that there is still continued discussion about the regulation uh, of the press. And I think Gitto is going to touch on uh, these issues in his speech tonight. I first got to know Gitto um, back when we were both working for the BBC. Um, in uh, 1991, that shows how old we were, we were um, during the first Gulf War, the first Gulf War in 1991. Gitto was uh, posted to Amman in Jordan, and I was in Washington, D.C. And um, as the war went on, uh, Raja Khamri's post Hound program used to pit us against each other at the end of every afternoon. And there was Gitto standing up for the dispossessed Kurds in northern Iraq and the downtrodden Palestinians and fighting their cause. And I was cast as the cheerleader for George Bush Sr., he being the uh, megalomaniacal millionaire intent on world domination, how things have changed. Uh, now, just to look at the title of our uh, lecture tonight, this comes from uh, a conversation Git and I had some 10 years ago. In a previous incarnation, I was desperate to get Rodri Morgan and his cabinet on the UK media, and it just wasn't <laughs> working. So I had a chat with Gitto, and he said at that time, Wales? You're not on their radar. So I suggested this as a title, and Gitto very craftily said, I'm not going to answer the question, 
before we've, asked, we've, uh, we've actually asked it. So the question is, Wales, not on their radar? Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not things have changed from 10 years ago when uh, Gitter had his own unique take on it. So with that, Gallwn Droid Croeso Tim Galon i Gitter Harri a Diolch yn iawn, cyn i ni ddechrau. Nos with that, Bow Bidwin Coviam er Callan Holly get a Tim at Radio Cymru or Tim and the Gelling Ganolin Cavaliad, but Eddie Nir Hanvoyai, Governor Adaven Borkin and Aguelliachos, a Raur or Benicon or Deed, in or Hilly Joy and Ganadim Senior Bethid Wade, no matter Bina. Nos with that, Yochvariani, he Amangwaha the Imam, I was unblessed to know Liger Deed, to Rethani Malgo Bre Bafta, say on Othidnoid Vinsani, Agony Melbourne Gubonam at Talent or Credit Grid, the Mondo, Othidnoid Vinsani. Castel Mapeth a mid of Ringe Camrega of Nid, or then Blesser Pier, Arini Jenny of Odomaheno of Vincothi, Penodaras, or Uguil, Achus Maraid with Aid, Nessie the Hedre, Hustweta, America Gavra, Nine Seath, Dechrar der Hog Vesli, Gavres, Arloisol, Ashwedel, Buise, Green Credit. But we're here tonight to discuss the democratic deficit, not the only one in Welsh politics, but a very important one. One, uh, the presiding officer cares passionately about, uh, and one that she has been quite right to focus upon. So let me start by agreeing with the core premise. A healthy democracy needs a robust and responsible press, independent, professional, well-resourced, and free from political interference. That's why I'm proud to be playing my small part in a big battle at the moment, currently underway, to preserve that freedom and see off the lobbyists and politicians that are trying to override centuries of very important tradition. A free press and a mature democracy cannot and should not be at the mercy of the politicians that it seeks to hold to account. And nor does it need to be. I can look you all in the eye tonight and as somebody who's quite heavily involved in all these discussions and say that I am extremely confident that there will be a robust new regulator in place by the spring. Paid for by the industry but delivering virtually everything that Lord Justice Leveson demanded able to levy fines of up to a million, able to order corrections, to demand apologies, to initiate investigations, and what's more, nearly the entire industry is signed up to this, left and right, tabloid and broadsheet, local, regional, and so-called national press. There is no need for a royal charter. The recognition body that will be established by that charter will be redundant. Another quango with no real role, a sad waste of precious taxpayers' funds. I would hope everyone in this room who wants a robust and responsible press would basically agree with that sentiment and encourage the speedy establishment of the body that would be known as IPSO, the Independent Press Standards Organization. The threat of regulation, however, is not the main threat that I've been asked to address tonight. The democratic deficit that the presiding officer has highlighted is focused not on the freedom of the press, but on its outlook. And the argument basically is that too many people in Wales rely on the London media for their news. And the London media, though strong, independent, and professional, hopefully, is either ignorant or not interested in Wales. That's the claim. It is a fact that a number of Welsh people watch network news and read so-called national newspapers. Hopefully not a bad thing. I speak for a company that produces The Sun, Times, and The Sunday Times, and I'm proud to say about three million people pay to read one of those papers every day. About 400,000 of them during the course of the week in Wales. About 300,000 people watch the six o'clock network news on the BBC and others will watch Sky, ITV and others. I won't go into social media tonight, but often the numbers there dwarf uh, the so-called traditional media. My old boss Boris now has more than 800,000 followers on Twitter, people that he can access without the filter of the press or indeed his spin doctor. Um, not always wise. My current boss Rupert Murdoch has half a million followers and he talks to them pretty uh, openly in very plain Antipodean English. Um, digital platforms offer cheap and effective opportunities in Wales that could overcome some of the difficult distribution issues that we've had in Wales historically. And I think that any platform that can reach Welsh speakers across the globe effortlessly and virtually for free has got to have huge potential, though I won't dwell on this any further tonight. Nor will I talk about the Welsh press and media covering a Cymraeg a They matter, and I'm pleased to have witnessed 
a period of considerable investment in news and current affairs and particularly in political journalism during my professional lifetime where I was once part of a tiny team for BBC Wales, and it's great to see Catherine Allen here tonight, tiny team led by Catherine Allen over there in Westminster that is now a pretty hefty department with a lot of emerging talent and plenty of outlets, including uh, a lot of live and, uh, uh, and coverage of, uh, of the Senate. No, I've been asked to address a particular claim that has considerable and possibly growing resonance, the suggestion that the London media is ignorant, dismissive, hostile, or patronizing. Clearly it hasn't always been well informed or perhaps well intentioned or as well intentioned as it should be and attitudes towards Wales across Offers Dyke are often less than ideal. I have my own horror stories. Uh, please take your silly name and even more stupid accent back to Wales where you belong uh, was one charming response from a listener who heard my first broadcast on the World at One about 25 years ago. I remember the rest of it too. Living in England I'm well aware of the hatred that the Welsh race has towards the English nation. Why should we, the English, put up with ghastly Welsh plebs, that's me, uh, preaching to us on Radio 4? And there was another complaint to my editor that essentially went along the lines of, I do not know his name, but he's very Welsh, uh, with a one-dimensional voice and the brain of a retarded amoeba. Not only a clever amoeba, not even a clever amoeba, not even an amoeba with special needs or learning difficulties, a retarded amoeba. Um, and I remember being sent to Wales for the first time on a story for the network and the producer on the flagship Today programme saying, get me lots of poor people with strong accents. I was shocked. Hopefully you're shocked. Um, I think that's changed. The lead anchor on the Today programme is a boy from Splot called John Humphreys. Uh, does a magnificent job. The main TV news at 10 o'clock news, as we all know, is... Uh, presented most nights by Hugh Edwards, a boy from Llangenech. Well, try pronouncing Llangenech if you were brought up in Surrey. Um, more important in my view are the men and women who've been reporters in Wales for the network. Tim Hartley, one of them. Rhina Bjorwith, Gail Foley, Sean Lloyd, a whole host of numbers, but perhaps in particular under Wira Davis, I think there was quite a, quite a distinct perceptive change from my point of view. Not only did they ensure that major milestones in Welsh history were covered on the network, but major stories now that could be done anywhere in the UK quite often are done in Wales. The recent storms, for instance, that hit large chunks of the UK, as far as I clicked, one of the main evening news on a Sunday thing with a huge audience, the main package was done from Aberystwyth by the excellent Howard Griffiths. He was giving the story across the UK, but he was doing it from Wales. That, I think, is a real breakthrough. Not tokenistic coverage, not ticking a box called let's put Wales on the bulletin for the sake of it, but doing a main story from Wales using Welsh-based correspondence. There are other stories like that in the field of crime, welfare changes, social trends, business stories, not enough of them, but done in Wales rather than in the Midlands, West Country, or traditionally within the M25. I've also done trawl, protectively, defensively, um, of recent Welsh stories that have been done in the Sun and the Times, produced by the company that I work for. Wales offered tax raising powers in the Times. Higher stamp duty to be applied on second homes, done in the Times for a reason. Cardiff Airport nationalised, done in the Times. Plaid's victory in Ennis Morn, done pretty much everywhere. And believe it or not, the Welsh government offering business advice to lap dancers. I missed that one, but I looked it up. It's, it's true, and no connection, but the Sun has done a bunch of stories too, including an employment roadshow. Um, tied to the previous one in Cardiff, uh, where they took an opinion piece from uh, Carwin Jones. Um, and I heard today that there's going to be a similar gig next year, so the Sun will come back to Cardiff um, with a roadshow like that and to help create jobs. And with two Welsh teams in the Premier League, Doctor Who in Cardiff Bay and one Cardiff Comprehensive that miraculously managed to produce go both um, Gareth Bale and Sam Warburton in the same vintage, um, I'm pleased to say and I have to tiptoe carefully here, but I did speak to him this morning, that the new editor of The Sun, who's a very decent guy and a Scot, is starting to think about investing in a stronger presence and possibly an office in Wales. The Sun already has an Irish edition, a Scottish edition, very well-staffed office in Manchester, covering the north of England, and often doing a separate edition for the north of England. And though it's early days yet, a Sun office in Cardiff or possibly Swansea is not out of the question. I think that would be great for journalism in Wales. I obviously think there is room for improvement. It would be good to see more coverage of Wales and better coverage of Wales in press and broadcast. But cards on the table now. Do I think Wales gets a particularly 
rough deal from the responsible press in London? I'm afraid the answer for me is not really. You can only really argue that point if you can show that there are great stories in Wales which could resonate much further afield that are being ignored. So let's imagine being the editor of the 10 o'clock news, looking at his or her running order tonight, wondering what to put in the programme. Every day there'll be at least one big political story, maybe two or three. Then there's business, industry, the markets, both here and abroad. I spent two years in New York pitching a story literally every day from there. Then you've got big bureaus in Washington, Brussels, Johannesburg and Jerusalem, all pitching stories that have resonance across entire continents. Then there's science, technology, nature, culture and the quirky. Only eight or nine of those stories will make it onto the bulletin. That's where the bar is set. And how often really sincerely is it a Welsh story that can cross that bar? When there is, as a whole, my contention is they get done. The presiding officer suggests in Welsh agenda that policy differences at the assembly would be interesting to English audiences. Maybe, but to be honest, not very often. Not very often even for Welsh audiences. News has got to be novel. Journalism is about telling great tales that help people make sense of the world and ideally take better decisions because they're better informed. Particular stories are great if they tell a broader universal truth. Big themes come alive if they can be put in the compelling context of a particular personal place. The fact that Wales does some political things differently is not that interesting in itself. Doing things differently is only interesting if there are lessons that can be drawn for people outside the immediate patch. If I asked you tonight how many people here would be interested in the proceedings of Milton Keynes' council, I can confidently predict there wouldn't be many. And I'm not comparing Milton Keynes with Wales, nor the Senate with the council. But if I asked you whether you thought it was a good idea to allow people to vote in a referendum on whether they wanted their taxes to go up or their services to be cut, you might find that interesting. And yes, Milton Keynes held such a referendum many years ago, and I, as a young reporter on the World of One, was sent there to cover it. It was interesting. It did have wider resonance. And that was not because they needed to tick a box called Milton Keynes, nor actually point out the differences between a council outside the M25 or within it. It wasn't a story about Milton Keynes. It was a story about people and what they're prepared to pay for politics and what they want in return which is universal and timeless, as all good news stories should be. There have been stories here at the Assembly. What the Senate decided on organ donation was genuinely interesting. An example of Wales leading the way, trailblazing on an issue that will save lives. It begged the question virtually everywhere else, why aren't you this doing this too? I was proud, and guess what? It got coverage. It got coverage on TV, it got coverage in the most prestigious and in the biggest outlets, including The Sun. Going back a bit to a story I covered myself as a political journalist, I remember coming down here to cover the toppling of Alan Michael as First Minister. A real story, again, of universal resonance, well beyond the patch. Think of it in Shakespearean terms, Shrodri and Alan, two men, one destined to lead his clan but condemned by outside interference to serve under another chief who never wanted the job in the first place. Two lives ruined until a dramatic coup puts them both out of the misery and everybody lives happily ever after. That's why that story worked. Not because it was a tick box about Cardiff or devolution. Let's do the token devolution story with boring graphics saying what the powers of the assembly are. I'm not saying that Karen Jones has to be toppled for the Senate to get noticed, though it probably would guarantee it. But in four years working with Boris Johnson at City Hall in London, I found it pretty easy to get coverage of his political agenda as well as the huge personality of the mayor himself. And I can't help wondering, to be honest with you, why there isn't more interest in the First Minister in Wales, in Catherine Jones. Catherine Jones is the most senior Labour figure, not only in Wales, but in office across the UK today. What he and his team do here could easily be seen as a template for what Britain would be like under a Labour government, a distinct possibility in 18 months' time. He could also offer an alternative outlook on his own party leader, as I dare say Boris Johnson occasionally did. Trust me, either of those things would be interesting, but how many people in this room, about as well-informed and engaged as they come, feel they could explain what the big story is here? 
Could you really articulate how number 10 would be different if the inhabitant was more like Carwin Jones than David Cameron? I don't feel, as someone who spent more than a decade as a fairly senior uh, political correspondent and as a Welsh-speaking Welshman from Cardiff, that I could spell out in sim simple sentences what the current Welsh agenda is. What is the big story? So is the London media missing something? Or is the administration and the wider political class in Cardiff failing to articulate something? Politicians don't just get coverage. It's not part of the package when you're elected. It has to be earned and generated. Apart from doing something distinct and tangible, it needs to be timely, relevant, in tune with wider agendas and public preoccupations. And guess what? Journalists need TLC. They need help making sense of a fast-moving, complex world which they now have to report and interpret in an instant. Do the big players in Wales do enough to cultivate those contacts, engage with influential journalists, provide them with compelling tales that will put them in the paper or on the bulletin, stories that get over that mark? That's one of the eight things that are covered on the 10 o'clock news. In other words, are we still too passive in our politics in Wales? sitting in Cardiff, complaining about coalition cuts, and then moaning that the London media doesn't care. I hope I'm wrong. There are, of course, some specific policy issues where Wales is making its mark, tuition fees, prescription charges, nationalizing an airport, and there are interesting questions to be asked on all of those. Difficult questions about political priorities, good use of precious public funds, whether political creed or sentiment is clashing with sound public policy. If the London media hasn't caught up with the fact that Wales is dishing out free paracetamol to the masses, but denying some cancer sufferers drugs that they could get in England, be grateful, perhaps. When The Sun did a whole page a few months ago on unemployment in the valleys, they found a family where four generations had never worked. Not a great picture for Wales, not a great advert for a one-party sort of rule by Labour over decades in the valleys. I'm almost tempted to say, careful what you wish for. But that isn't my view, of course. I believe in a free press as a core component of an effective democratic system. And here in Wales, not uniquely, but as in far too many countries, that free press is increasingly struggling to survive. Most papers have seen circulation decline and advertising collapse. Most respond with cuts. I'm pleased that my company is very clear that cuts are not the answer. And because we charge for our papers online as well as in print, we can invest in them. Our stated mission is to secure a sustainable future for news. And next year, we'll be moving to a new building where we've taken out a 30-year lease. So we intend to stick around for the long term. It's a long-term commitment. Lasting that long means finding new people to read our title on different platforms and new people to write them and produce them, of course. And one of the sad effects of the decline in local and regional papers is that the food chain that feeds talent to the big papers has been depleted considerably. So I'm particularly pleased tonight to be able to share with you details of an ambitious new scheme that we'll be formally announcing tomorrow to invest in the future of journalism by investing in the next generation of journalists. We're calling it the News Academy, using established journalists from The Sun, The Times, and The Sunday Times to get today's teenagers to appreciate news and consider a career in it. We will send them to speak to thousands of young people in hundreds of schools across the UK, including in Wales. I'll go back to the school, Gavin Clanhari, if they'll take me. There'll be competitions and a website where the best photos, features, and news can be published. That website will offer online training tools, free of charge, providing the basic skills to operate effectively, how to spot a story, how to write for news, how to stay within the law, adhere to a code of ethics, build contacts, and so forth. And we'll be holding a series of one-day conferences in Glasgow, Manchester, Dublin, and yes, I'm pleased to say, here in Cardiff. A chance, hopefully next March, for up to 200 Welsh students between 15 and 18 to spend a day with senior figures across the industry, getting tips and exploring whether they may want to pursue one of the most interesting and worthwhile careers I can think of. Wales needs good journalists. Welsh democracy, hopefully still evolving, needs a strong press. Yes, we could and should seek better coverage from London, but what we need above all is to sort out our story here in Wales. If we don't know it, how can we ever expect others to tell it? Diochavariam. Diochavariam, Gitto. Gitto is willing to take uh, questions um, in Welsh or in English. Uh, please feel free. One at a time, though. We're not going to take them in batches this time.
If there are other questions, it's fine. I'll do it in English. So you provocatively said that we don't know what the base story is. But you have been thinking about this. You come from a particular background. Uh, you must have some ideas yourself about what the base story is or how that should be presented or how we should arrive at that. Is it a, an issue between the political parties or is it something which is an umbrella across all those parties? I had written in a section that posed a long list of questions. Where do the jobs come from? Why are we the second worst part of the UK for attracting inward investment now when we were close to the top? Do we want the Commonwealth Games in 2026 or not? What are our prospects of getting it? How do we aim that way? How will we react to Scotland becoming independent or react to Scotland voting against independent independence? There are a whole string of questions that, to which I'm not sure there are answers to. Why do we think that it's good to sort of hand out paracetamol rather than you know, and deny people cancer drugs? Are we comfortable with the idea that waiting lists go up, but prescriptions are free? Are we comfortable with educational standards having fallen behind since devolution? All these things were meant to get better. And not only do I not know, as somebody who's reasonably well informed, what the answers are to those individual questions, but I know how they hang together. I don't know what the agenda is. And I do think that credit to Ron Davis in his day that he created a sense of mission for Wales and a sense of purpose. And there are people in this room who are involved in that. But there's a real sense that Wales needed devolution because Wales could do things differently and could do things uh, more constructively and maybe in a more sort of humane way or in a more sort of progressive, liberal kind of way. But at the moment, I don't know where the jobs come from. I would pose a question myself uh, when there are 200 hedge funds in Paris, each worth an absolute fortune. One hedge fund in particular has two to three billion quid to chuck about not to mention what the partners earn and where they spend it. Those hedge funds are being clobbered at the moment by the high taxes imposed by uh, a socialist prime minister. If what I would like to see would be a politician in Cardiff jump on the Eurostar and go to Paris and say, if your government doesn't want the jobs and wealth and the tax revenue and all the spillover that you create, we would. But when I pose this, and I've, I've, I've played a parlor game with a lot of Welsh politicians on this when I've suggested that they've all come back with you well you can't possibly sort of expect us to advocate bringing hedge funds into Cardiff you know it's like bankers everybody hates them and you know that's the sterile nature of a politics that is still too sentimental and emotionally tied to a few sort of great sort of myths about a sort of labor tradition and not sort of open enough to the hard-headed facts of where do the jobs come from and where do you generate the taxes from in order to be able to spend them on things that we're so good at spending upon uh, in Wales. And David Melding here has sort of established a wonderful think tank to try and pose some of those questions, but it's not there. And until it's there, you know, why, why, why would it get covered? And if, you know, David Miliband has proved in a few weeks how he can dominate the agenda very effectively by identifying a big theme, the cost of living crisis, by ch homing in on the cost of fuel bills this winter. There's been nothing in the limited powers of the Welsh Assembly to stop a political agenda in Wales, if you wanted a left-wing political agenda, from having gone big on that. First Minister has the power to haul in those who sort of run the water companies, the energy companies, anyone who virtually issues a bill that Welsh households are forced to pay, nothing to stop them haul hauling them in and saying this isn't good enough. And there's been years in which Wales could have done that. We had two years working in City Hall to show how a Conservative administration might do things slightly different to a government run by Gordon Brown. And I think in two years we showed a very different agenda, and it'd be good if Wales was to show a different agenda now. <laughs> if that answers the question. I don't think uh, there is an immediate answer to it, obviously. It's a, it's a debate that we all need to have yeah. so that we know which direction we're traveling in. 
and therefore then things will become clear as to whether it is the funds in Paris or whether it is mm. a left-wing agenda. We don't know where we stand at the moment, but we are all searching for that inspiration, I think. Perhaps what, uh, another way of putting it is, I just remember being um, a, a sort of young reporter on the World of One and being terrified in the editorial meetings that were particularly ruthless uh, intellectually. And there was an editor who after 10 seconds, his eyes would start to glaze over. After 20, if you're not making your point, he'd start sort of coughing. After 25, he'd say, I'm bored. And if you carried on after 30 without him sort of being turned around, you wouldn't speak for weeks afterwards and probably wouldn't have a great future on the program. So it's a good test of why should Wales be on the world of one today in 20 seconds? You know, it's, it's a particularly harsh way of putting it, but try doing it in two minutes. It's quite hard on most days. Organ donation, a great example. More of that, you're there. We're there. Who's next? Uh, yeah, I have to be careful, but um, a year ago when I had um, only very recently joined the company, there was a chief executive who was particularly interested, uh, he was, he was uh, a Kiwi, and he was quite shocked when he uh, flew in, parachuted in to save the company in deep trouble, but he was quite horrified by the London-centric nature of the UK, not just in journalism but across the board. And he was a man who sort of invested very heavily in, in, in a, a new office in Manchester. And I think the, the way that was heading was towards a Northern England edition, as there is one in Scotland, there is one in Ireland, and he'd started talking about one in Wales. At the time, the editor of The Sun was not interested. There's a new editor of The Sun now who's a Scot. He is interested. I spoke to him today, explaining that I was coming here, and we've talked about this a lot, and said, can I just hint at this? And he said, well, you know, I haven't cleared the budget, I haven't really nailed, worked it out or anything like that. So I, I introduced that caveat. But if you're asking whether I think we should invest in covering South Wales, Wales, but in particularly in the South, because frankly for the Sun, again, it's a point, it's not the politics that will draw people here. It'll be the football, it'll be Catherine Zeta-Jones being back on Single Street. Uh, it'll be, you know, if she is, um, changes from day to day. It'll be, you know, social things. It'll be the quirky stories. It'll be shocking crime things. It'll be uh, examples of uh, welfare excess. You know, careful what you wish for. But I think there is, a, there is definitely an interest, a strong interest in doing this. And I think the fact that we will be looking to sort of recruit 200 teenagers in Wales to the, the News Academy uh, which we can establish in the new year would be a sign of that commitment extended to Wales very clearly. Yeah. Um, oh <laughs> um, I'm a journalism student in Cardiff University. I'm doing postgraduate as you might did yes. a couple years ago. Yes, long so time ago. <laughs> is there any like uh, suggestions? How can we, like we are international students, we are actually very passionate about maybe ca um, give contribution to Welsh society and maybe have some impact, maybe even in China. Uh, is there any suggestion? And uh, maybe for our postgraduate study, is there any suggestion? Maybe practical experience, maybe like uh, just something we could learn from. Thank you. P um, experience in, in the company or on the titles or, or something I advocate you take back to China. Sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we kick around at the moment in the debate about regulation of the press is the UK has traditionally been a, a, a real beacon for the rest of the world of what a free press looks like in a mature, sophisticated, quite delicately balanced democracy, which is why, though it looks slightly over the top for some people, which is why the idea that politicians are in the mix at any point, however convoluted, in potentially licensing what can be said in newspapers is something that we go to the wall on as, as a free press in the UK. And one of the things that's been interesting for me is 
letters that we've had, particularly from countries in the Commonwealth, saying, please don't go down this step. If Britain has state regulation of the press, then just imagine what it would be like for me in China or Zimbabwe or, you know, um, Ukraine. Um, so there is a genuine concern. That's, that's relevant. Uh, what I would urge you with China, what can I say? My experience of China was to go there with, with the great Boris Johnson uh, at a fascinating time of juxtaposition where China was staging the Olympics and the closing ceremony, which was, you know, if, if ever there was a display of um, state superiority, uh, it was, uh, it was um, in your face. And it coincided, by coincidence, uh, with the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And our Chinese host could not sort of enjoy more the contrast between a great symbol of Western capitalism going down the pan as Chinese communism was actually sending fireworks into the sky and sort of putting on a magnificent display. But you know, I left China sort of with a lot of respect for how doing things slowly but surely and humbly and determinately should never be underestimated um, as we're all learning. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Um. Um, I was just wondering, um, obviously you've talked about um, the fact that there has to be stories that are interesting enough to kind of make it into uh, a news bulletin that has only you know, eight or nine items. Um, and thinking about the group of, of newspapers that you currently you know, are working for, that, that obviously they have commercial interests. Mm. So they have, if something's not interesting, they don't have an obligation necessarily to cover it. Um, I was wondering how that works in terms of something like the BBC, which is funded by everybody in the UK mm. equally, and whether you think there's a difference between um, the obligations that more commercial um, broadcasters or, or newspapers have um, in comparison to something like the BBC, which has that kind of pu public service obligation, and, and maybe there's a, a distinction between the two of those. I think the BBC has a duty, which it takes very seriously, to cover important things, whether they're interesting or not. Ideally, and I think it's true, the BBC goes out of his way to make things more interesting than perhaps the people involved in them have, to bring alive things that, you know, general public have failed to bring alive, referenda on, you know, alternative voting systems, for instance, the next European elections, you know, the BBC will rightly cover them. Actually, that's a bad example because that would be fascinating. Um, and, and the BBC is right to do that. But even the BBC approaches it thinking, we don't want to do something that's a massive turn off for the audience. So the audience don't have to pay for it. Well, they paid for it up front through a forced tax. Um, but they do have to watch it, ideally. And I think the pressure is slightly more in your face on a daily basis when you're producing a newspaper that people actually have to pay to read. So if you get a bit too worthy then, you'll see your sales go down. But I don't think that's the fundamental clash in the end because good news is interesting. My example of Milton Keynes, you can tell me, you know, if I was to say top line is a council story in Milton Keynes, what a turn off. But there are interesting stories everywhere. And one of the best pieces of journalism I've ever seen was a story that Matt Fry did on education in, in Japan. Why should we care? But it was such a superb piece of journalism that went to the core of the human spirit and what matters to all of us and that what our hopes are, whether we're in Japan or whether we're in Upper Kumtur or lower, um, that you know it had resonance. And I think that's the test in the end. Virtually everything should be interesting, or if it's not, why is it being done? My father, how dare he? <laughs> you talked about priorities on World of One, for instance. I'm happy to speak in Welsh, by the way. I just didn't know this. Well, it's all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I want to know is, how can you do priorities if you're not aware of certain things? If they're not there, they can't be prioritized. Sorry, if you get my meaning. Uh, sometimes. I read, you know, about the uh, glut of bilingual schools in in Britain now, and we have a glut of bilingual schools in Wales. They're not aware of them. That otherwise they would surely, you know, discuss them. Anyway, when I was on the World of One, one of the producers I worked with most was an excellent woman called Jo Cayford, Dr. Joanne Cayford, who grew up in Port Talbot, had a PhD from Aberystwyth. Uh, which was about the Welsh press, and she read about Wales every day and talked to her family back in Port Talbot. She knew exactly what was going on. She also read 
just about every magazine and newspaper she could get hold of before 7.30 in the morning. And she was doing that test herself. Um, so it's not that people are ignorant. There, there are reporters on The Sun. There's a deputy news editor on The Times now. The number two on The Times now has uh, roots in Wales and spends a lot of time here. So it's not ignorance in the end. These are hard-headed people who make judgments every day of the relative resonance of different stories and issues and debates uh, and developments around the globe. And even though there's much more space in a, an edition of the Times than there is on the 10 o'clock news, even that is contested. And these days you can see what people read. And if you consistently see on your online version that nobody's reading stories of a certain ilk, it gets harder and harder to pitch them. Um, Gitto, you talked about Carwin and uh, his uh, reluctance, I think, is what you were hinting at, to, uh, to project himself. It's not himself. a personal point. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the, the, he's not been successful in projecting himself on a UK uh, uh, level. So certainly one area he's tried to project himself has been on constitutional matters, and I know, you know this is a big story, but perhaps not one that is always gripping for the public, but uh, whether seeds is a big issue. The UK is rather an odd state in accepting with equanimity the principle of secession. Mm -hmm. And Carwin has said some very interesting things about the need for more formal federal approach, a constitutional convention that includes the whole of the UK. And Peter Riddell, um, in the, the earlier uh, function we had, uh, and pretty much agrees with your view generally, I think, that we've just got to work harder on uh, the stories and the and the stuff that is really interesting uh, does get covered uh, as long as we can present it in an attractive way. But he did say that he had some sympathy with uh, Wales's rather muted voice on UK constitutional questions and that perhaps some ideas coming from Wales find it difficult to get a platform in London and in, and in Scotland to some extent as well. Uh, whereas ideas that are sometimes weaker just because they emanate from London get quite a lot of coverage. Do you agree with that? If they go further faster because they emanate in London, it's probably because it's easier for somebody to make the pitch. Um, because journalists are not people who wake up in the morning thinking, oh, today I'm going to do a story about you know, the implications for federalism of a yes vote or a no vote in Scotland. Somebody has to put the idea in their head. That happens when you bump into them at a party or you drag them to a lecture or you write something that gets published and somebody reads it. Um, so it, it is a case, I think, of, of trying harder. And maybe over the next year, we see, we've seen over the last three days how Scotland can totally dominate uh, the agenda on, 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 on the defense budget in the UK. The whole, whole debate about what kind of ships the, what's left of the UK uh, Navy will have in years to come was dominated the last few days by whether it should be in, Gla in, in Glasgow Govan or in Portsmouth. That is Scotland, that is Alex Salmon being able to dominate the British debate, not only getting the Brits to notice what's going on in Scotland, just by playing to that gallery very, very cleverly and determinately. But the contrast, I must say, between uh, Alex Salmond and his operation and various administrations in Wales couldn't be starker. You know, we, we look at a time, I still remember when Ply Cymru took Rhonda and Isloin, and the SNP did a similar thing in Scotland. Then Scotland voted for devolution and Wales voted for devolution within a week of each other or a fortnight, whatever it was. You know, that's where we were not that long ago. And since then, Scotland has gone like this and Wales has chugged along. Um, so there is, you know, they haven't got a head start. They've got Jim Nochty, we've got John Humphreys. They haven't got Hugh Edwards. But it's not just that, it's about the power of your argument, it's about the strength of your vision, it's about the determination with which you want to go out there and make the case. So if Karen wants to be our voice on that, there'll be willing outlets for, for a voice that says, let me tell you why the UK would be stronger together, from the perspective more unexpected than you would think of somebody who's a soft Welsh nationalist, to his credit, Garfield. Uh, 
Um, Siwr gynnau, na prinder swyddi ar gyfer newyddiadurwyr ydy'r broblem, nid prinder mm. newyddiadurwyr, felly pam dach chi'n blansio'r cynllun? Gafon ni gynhadledd yn Llundain dros yr haf fel arbrawf a, a be nyth yn ei ddarganfod, oedd bod newyddiadureth yn uh, brysur ddod yn proffesiwn ar gyfer bobl sydd naill ei ddim eisiau neill lot o arian, a ddim yn gorffwyr achos bod nhw'n byw mewn dinasoedd y clawd. Uh, neu bod nhw o gartrefu mor o lidog bod ddim angen iddyn nhw dalu i ffordd i hunain. Bod nhw'n lot mwy o trust y ffeiriens mewn newyddiadureth yr enghraifft. A bod uh, bobl ifanc o gymdiroedd mwy cyffredin, a ddim, ddim clawd o anghenoedd yn jyst mwy cyffredin, yn diystyru newyddiadureth fel, fel proffesiwn nawr, achos ar ôl mynd trwy goleg a cael dyledion anferth, dyw newyddiadureth yn mentalu, ddigon iddyn nhw dalu uh, y bilion ôl. Dyna ddechreuodd y peth. Uh, ar ben hynny, mae ma angen lot o hyder a ddyn i fod yn anefau niw i fod yn newyddiadur o argohoeddiad yn enwedig ar, ar y teledu. Ac un o'r pethau dyw ysgolion y wludwriaeth ddim yn wneud cystal ac ysgolion preifat yw rhoi yr hunan hyder yn ei bobl. Felly un o'r pethau ni eisiau wneud yw meithrin y diddordeb, meithrin yr hyder, dangos y ffordd, nid ar y lefel mae cyrsiau y ffordd i mewn colegau, ond just i rhywun dechrau ni'n dechrau eich oed i gael syniad beth yw newyddiadureth. A ni hefyd eisiau cyfle i nad newyddiadureth yw mynd ar y we a rhoi fideo ar YouTube, neu sgwennu blog, neu tweetio rhywbeth, neu rhoi rhywbeth ar eich Facebook. Mae newyddiadureth broffesiynol go iawn yn rhywbeth sydd yn broffesiynol, gyda gwerthoedd, gyda yr angen am hyfforddiant, uh, gyda safonau yw cynnal o, o ran cywirdeb ac o ran moesoldeb hefyd, am yr hen ni'n cael eu profi ar fynyd. Um, a, a gyda thechnegau, ac un o pethau ni eisiau wneud yw trwy helpu bobl yn yr cam cyntaf yna i beidio diystyru newyddiadureth, ac os anw trwy'r ysgol brofiad i ni am rhoi dydyn nhw, fyddwn yn diweddu fyny ar cyrsiau ffordd i chi'n sôn amdano nhw. Catherine. You talk very much. You talk very much about going back to basics, almost in terms of training, beliefs, getting your core message, talking about vision for the future. Would that get with all the Twitter, Twitter noise today? Um, and I was just wondering your view around that. There's um, there's a difference between heat and light, and noise and and, and a Bach concerto or a sort of in my case a jazz song. Um, I still think the more that is out there, ultimately the more people appreciate somebody who curates, who edits, who sifts through all the nonsense and finds for them what is, what is, what is of interest. Uh, and I think that's a, the core offering of newspapers these days is not, you know, anyone here can just set their computer so that every day they only get stories about Cardiff City Football Club and what's happening in the NHS in, in Madagam or whatever, if you want. But I think there will always be a market for people saying, I like the Times because it's X, or I like the Guardian because it's X, and you take the package, and you expect somebody to challenge you every day by putting things in front of you that you wouldn't seek uh, yourself. And just because we can all book our holidays doesn't mean that we don't occasionally want a travel agent to do it for us. Um, so I think there is a future for journalism like that. Uh, it's harder because when people have the option of some news for free, it's harder to make them pay good money to fund the journalism that is authoritative and well-informed and wittier and sharper and has some sort of kite mark on it. But that's the battle that we as a company in particular have, have, have gone for. We put all our products behind a paywall and said, you want this kind of journalism? It costs. You wouldn't open a restaurant and give the food away for free. If you do that, you end up with nonsense. You end up with you know, a newsroom like the Huffington Post with 10 people in it. If you want proper journalism where you've got a correspondent on the ground in Syria and you've got a columnist who's been around the block for 40 years and knows what he or she is talking about and you have humor and you have Sudoku or you have page three, <laughs> won't get into that debate, um, then it costs and it's paid for and you know, I think there is a future for that but it's, it's a future that's quite hard to fight for at the moment. Oh, sorry. Um, first of all, Geto, uh, um, can I thank you for, for a, a very, very useful corrective to um, uh, a very familiar whinge. Um, <laughs> and I think it's very important that these things are said, and I think you're absolutely spot on when it comes to sort of telling the Welsh story. Uh, uh, if I can pick up on David Melding's point, I think that whereas Carwin Jones has made quite a lot on the 
made a lot of waves on the sort of constitutional front, you know, I'm really surprised that he has not sought to make any waves on the economic front in terms of the rebalancing of the UK. Mm. That would seem to me to be a, another track in the agenda that, mm. uh, uh, that he uh, might have pursued and hasn't. Um, uh, but, you know, so I think that corrective is, is extremely useful. Uh, I do, however, want to pick you <laughs> up on one fat. thing. <laughs> Um, uh, and it's on your, uh, uh, it's on your uh, strictures about the, uh, what's proposed in terms of royal charters and the regulation, uh, regulation of the press. Uh, I, I, I declare an interest as a trustee of the Media Standards Trust um, uh, and a backer of the, uh, of the charter. Your description of um, uh, what would happen under these uh, circumstances, I think, does not pass the test of accuracy or fairness. <laughs> um, uh, uh, there is nothing in, the, uh, nothing in the recognition body that would prevent publication of anything uh, uh, in advance, and it is there to ensure that a system of self-regulation set up by the press would actually operate in an honest and an independent way. Because the record of the press over the last 50 years in this has been dreadful. We've had uh, uh, commission after commission after commission, last chance saloon, last chance saloon, time and again, and nothing has happened. And even through the depth of the phone hacking scandal and so on, the, the press was still saying that the press commission was okay. So the level of trust in the press to actually operate this is at rock bottom. And I think the recognition panel, to be honest, uh, will impose no kind of censorship on the press, but will actually do something to improve public trust in the press, and that certainly needs to be sorted out. A lot of this, I think, is based on a misperception of the PCC, Press Complaints Commission, being there to stop phone hacking. Phone hacking is a criminal offence, as I'm acutely aware at the moment, from daily calls uh, involving lengthy proceedings in the Old Bailey, there is a remedy for phone hacking, it's called the law. We don't need a new regulator to prevent phone hacking. It's illegal, so is paying public officials. There'll be another court case on that. So it's posing, it's, and from my point of view, deliberately uh, conflating two things that are unrelated. So the press regulator is never there to sort of uphold the law. The police are meant to do that and the prosecuting authorities. It is meant to be there to encourage responsible behavior by the press within what is already quite a, a, a tight legal framework. The libel laws in, in the UK, in England and Wales, uh, are tighter than in most countries. When I talk now on your point about the recognition body to American journalists and American lawyers, the idea that you can actually have the Privy Council, sounds grand, but it was nine ministers, nine members of the government sitting in secret, not publishing a criteria, not taking any evidence, deciding to pass a charter, put it in front of the Queen, um, I'll get into that one, and her sort of signing that, to create a body that can then tell the self-regulating press body, this is not good enough. You have to change that, you have to do it differently. If politicians can create the law, they can change the law. And it introduces for the first time into the dynamics of our fragile and, and subtle and carefully balanced organic constitution, the concept that politicians, via vote in parliament and via the Privy Council, which is essentially politicians behind closed doors, have a say over what is publishable and what isn't. And even though it's a point of principle at the moment, it's not hard to imagine in a context that we've had very recently, that being used to sort of say, your regulation ain't good enough, you need to tighten it, who are you? At that point, they say, we are a body charged with recognizing you or not recognizing you, set up by Royal Charter with politicians lying in the background. It doesn't feel right. It's not right. <laughs> Beg to differ. One in the back. Thanks. If I could just return back to coverage of the Assembly uh, briefly and perhaps one aspect that's not been picked up tonight. Perhaps it's not necessarily um, the problem of the world at one editor not taking a Welsh news story or wanting to cover a, news a Welsh news story, but more the fact that when he leads with, uh, for example, uh, Michael Gove's education reforms, 
there's often very little mention or often no mention at all that those reforms aren't going to apply to their Welsh listeners. Um, I mean, I know there's difficulties and in the flow of news and in sort of reporting that, but it, it, it is a problem. Yeah, I think th it's a very fair point, but I do think the BBC in particular is quite striking these days, and I, I'd say the same for the Times in pointing out these do not apply in Wales. So they may not cover what the s situation is in Wales, but they at least point out that Michael Gove's so-called reforms only apply uh, in England. Uh, and to which I'd say, as long as they do that, fine. The challenge then is to sort of ring up the producers and say, now, if you're interested in education reform, let me tell you about something really dramatic and interesting and worthwhile that we're doing in Wales that you don't know about. And I never know, you know, when, 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 when I got dragged into a debate about why Wales hadn't had any Olympic venues, I posed the question, did anyone ask for an Olympic venue? Did anyone go up and, you know, lobby Locog for the mountain biking to be near Bridgend or the sailing to be on the Clean Peninsula? And nobody put their hand up. It was just, there's some sort of expectation that somebody sitting somewhere that we've never met or never heard of will sit there and of all the great ideas that come into the head out of nowhere, intuitively, they will say, hey, why don't we do a piece on education reform in Wales? Somebody needs to get hold of them and tell them. Somebody needs to flag it up. Somebody needs to go and lobby for Olympic venues uh, for Wales. There won't be an Olympics in London for a long time now, but missed opportunity. But I'm not aware that anybody tried to get it. And yet the chorus of Wales being neglected was as loud as ever afterwards. It's still the passive politics that has you know, frustrated some of us enormously. And you know, some of us had hoped it would have changed a bit more um, under devolution. made tonight and they've been most interesting ones and I have enjoyed it very much. Do you think perhaps we ought to send our assembly members to a charm school? <laughs> um, I can't speak about the assembly members. I, I, will, I will say that a, a good friend who's a very well-known TV presenter uh, who got a show in Wales recently was shocked how hard it was to get assembly members to go on his show on a Sunday in Wales. Uh, I don't think he would mind me saying, but he was horrified. Whereas, you know, there are politicians fighting to get on the Andrew Marr show, to get on the daily politics, to get on the, all the programs that, you know, discuss politics, whether it's the weekend or late at night or early in the morning or whatever. And um, I think it is fair, you know, and he wouldn't mind me saying, but he was quite horrified how hard it was to get assembly members to come in on a Sunday morning to do stuff on a, on a, on a big flagship program like the one that you know, he was brought in to, to present. Now that's, you know, maybe shouldn't exaggerate the effect of that, but it suggests that maybe the energy and determination isn't quite as you know, ruthless and, and mad as it is elsewhere, but um, politicians are meant to be <laughs> slightly demented, aren't they? I'll leave that one. Any more? My former tutor. Taught me everything I know about journalism. I think it's a very uh, admirable thing uh, to be doing, to set up uh, and encouraging young people to come into journalism. But you still have a problem that there aren't so many jobs in journalism. Um, they are reducing, particularly in newspapers. And starting salaries are very low. Mm. And uh, what would you plan, if there is anything that can be planned, to turn that around? Um, I don't believe in the state creating jobs as such. I don't think you're suggesting that. Um, I think as a company, by charging for our product, we're able to invest in our product. By investing in our product, we're able to grow. The Sun on Sundays recently spent a million pounds hiring journalists when the Mirror were laying journalists off. A very poignant thing was that Tony Parsons, who's written for the Mirror for 18 years, left the Mirror. They could hardly afford to keep paying him, and he joined the Sun. Um, so we're hiring columnists, we're hiring people, we're hiring a lot of young, talented young people who can do things digitally that old codgers like me 
couldn't sort of do, or certainly not do as well. Um, so there are jobs, and there will be jobs if companies invest. Uh, and I think one of the disasters, one of the greatest miscalculations of the last 25 years in journalism was somehow, so at some particular point in time, the industry collectively did the Harry Carry, took the Harry Carry decision of deciding to give away its content. Stuff that you spend good money on producing, you started giving it away with no sense of what the consequences of that would be over time. And that's why the jobs are fewer and further between. Uh, so we would like to encourage people to go into journalism in the hope that we as a company will A, stick around for 30 years and B, grow over 30 years. Nobody's sort of standing still here. We're sort of bringing in new products, new apps. We're discussing some things today, opening new offices uh, all the time. Now, that's not going to create all the jobs for everyone we can uh, produce, but I'd also say that a background in journalism and a period in journalism is great, great training and a great skill to do a whole load of other things as well. So even if you only do journalism for a few years, it's great training to be all kinds of things, including Mayor of London. Gary. To the, what is the relative value to the company of um, a subscriber to the paper and a subscriber to the digital site? Uh, I think it's, um, it's top secret market sensitive information, but essentially we, we, I think it's fair to say that the Times, in order to uh, create a new business model, offered its digital product far too cheaply for many years. So we drove, we drove people who were paying good money to read the print edition, clever, though they, clever as they are, to think, why pay all that money to read in print? I don't mind reading it on my new tablet. At which point, we got a lot less money out of them. And even though it costs less to give news to people electronically than to print it on paper and drive it in vans across uh, the UK, you know, you understand more about the newspaper production uh, than I do. But, but, but in the end, that was, that was a, a bit of a mistake. It, it needed to be done in order to build up the subscription. So what we're trying to do now is to make sure that um, people, that we, we, we halt the hemorrhaging in the print buying of the papers by stopping the opportunity of people going to access the same content essentially for free elsewhere. So already there's some tiny indication that print sales of the print circulation of the sun has stopped falling as steeply since people had to pay for it online. Because if they're going to pay for it anyway, they think, well, then I might as well pay for it to buy the paper, because I actually quite like the paper. So hopefully, it'll even out, um, and, and the relative worth will be fairly similar. Gitta, thanks very much for a wide-ranging discussion. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's rather different that we spent twice as long on the question and answer as we did actually on, on, the, on the lecture, but thank you very much for that. I thought you were being mischievous when you started batting back the question and saying, the reason Wales gets no coverage is because you've got nothing of interest, you don't package it, and actually your politicians can't be asked to get out of bed on a Sunday. Um, but having said that, what I think we may have ducked here tonight is that you've given us three good news stories about the academy, about the possibility of a Sun office. Um, and what was the third one? On press regulation. And we've just got the BBC. We, we've got the BBC here, and Media, uh, Media Wales may do it through a press release. So we haven't actually got those outlets. And I think, I think that's, what, uh, uh, that's what your dad was talking about. We haven't got the outlets to let people know of what is actually happening, be that uh, a News UK press release or not. On the other galon, if you am to the audience, I'll let them. Thanks once again, and can we show our appreciation to get our in the traditional way? Can I add Kenneth Lethal Cymru, Corf, Cymru, 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 Ewch i cynulliad Cymru.org, neu gallwch ein dilyn ar Facebook a Twitter.